welcome to Get the Table, another wrestling roundtable discussion podcast with myself, Adam Wilborn, and the deadly boys of what culture, Michael Hamflet and Michael Sidgwick, here to discuss another burning wrestling issue. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts where we review Raw, SmackDown, NXT 2.0, oh! AW Dynamite, AW Rampage, pay per views, premium live events. We have interviews, more roundtable discussions like this one, and a round of the week complete with a very good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. As I said, though, joined by Hamlet and Sidgwick and Gents, we are gathered here today to talk about Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor. Michael Sidgwick, your immediate reaction to this news? It was one of those rumors that had been sort of bubbling, so I wasn't absolutely astonished. Um, but it was certainly worthy, I think, of the huge announcement hyperbole. That's always the case now with Tony Khan and his enthusiastic means of promoting <laughs> whether or not it matches the huge bluster, the big adjectives, all in caps, all the rest of it. I think it's certainly worthy. It's historic. Um, the number two promotion in the North America in North America, has purchased the number three. Um, mm. It's a huge one. I think they are the best custodians um, to do so. Whether or not it's going to impact on AEW is something we'll likely get into. But yeah, I think ultimately the big conversation was, is this enough? Or is the announcement going to substantiate the hype of the announcement? And I think it did. Yeah, I would agree. Um, custodian, stewardship, all that kind of thing. For the longest time, um, we've accepted WWE's role as by default, really. And it's just another one of those um, monopoly bursting things that AEW has now done. It's one thing to start a new wrestling company, not necessarily to rival WWE. They offer very different products, but to exist in its space that for years has only been occupied by one company. This is another part of that. Lots of wrestling from the 80s, 90s and beyond and all that was considered fair game for WWE to take and own as the winners of a war. But then... This is post-war stuff. This is new. And as part of that, I think it's on a very... Obviously, we're going to drill into the, the potential factors and how right, Ring of Honor and AW coexist, if indeed mm -hmm. they do, the management and all that kind of thing. But strictly from a bigger picture point of view, I think it looks good philosophically from AW's point of view to see uh, an opportunity to build a tape library of their own, to build law, that dreaded word, law <laughs> of their own, that is isolated completely from WWE's purview. It doesn't necessarily have to stop with Ring of Honor. There could be more down the line. But they're not going to feel as shocking because Tony Khan has now done it once. It's mm. always the first one that feels the biggest shock. And now after the fact, nobody needs to feel strange about it. Nobody, well, why is this not ended up under WWE's roof? Why is this not on the network? It's like, well, because there's other places where it can. Put it this way before we move on. Mm. Tony Khan is not going to um, green light and produce a bio DVD called The Rise and Fall of Ring of Honor and then <laughs> get his big cock out and say, ah, we pissed all over these lots. <laughs> we pissed these lads like you did with WCW. Like they are going to preserve mm. the, the, the honor, if you like, if you can excuse the pun, of the brand and what it's cultivated over the years. Um, you know, a lot of people have been saying this uh, about the money being chucked around millions of dollars. And I saw 40 million. I don't know the exact number. Exact. I don't think it's ever gonna, we're probably ever going to find out the exact number. And it's, it's weirdly sort of a risk and not a risk, isn't it? I.e. financially, like we've always said, AEW are never going to be struggling for money. They, they do want to balance the books, obviously. But in opportunities like this, as you alluded to, Sige, don't come around very often. It should be mentioned it's not being acquired through... All Elite Wrestling. Mm. It's a Tony Khan yes. personal investment that he's announced through the purview. He's not going to do it through Fulham Football Club. He's obviously <laughs> going it's related to AEW, if you like, but he hasn't acquired it. He's done it through his own immense personal wealth. Mm. I expect I'm not too sure. Is it is it that much of I mean, I saw some people saying this is, could either be his biggest masterstroke or his biggest, biggest disaster. How much of a risk is it, do you think? Financially, not at all. There's, there's no risks in your life if you're rich. And that's something that, like, Tony Khan can go from the EFED to the actual Ring of Honor owner because of immense wealth. There's no risk attached to that, whatever. From a creative standpoint, from a workload standpoint, Absolutely enormous. And that's the interesting thing I think we're talking about. Anyone that's particularly delving into the financial, especially at this point when all the figures aren't even really out there and it's a lot of speculative data, um, it's pointless. It's absolutely rudderless. Like, let this, like, really, really rich man purchase something. Like, would you particularly clutch your pills if he bought a helicopter? He's probably got one of them as well. <laughs> you know, like, he's just bought something that is worth an inordinate amount of money to us, but to people that exist in those circles, it's, it's nothing. But in terms of what he has already as his jobs... I guess is if you can like the, the I know they're not all roles. Sometimes it's just whether you sit on a board or you take a leadership role and you maybe just let to sign something off or tick something off. But in terms of all the various hats that he wears, that's I think where you can drill into a serious conversation like we're doing now and like other fans will do. Um, because it's already 
it's kind of an, one of these truisms within wrestling, the people that work on the roster. Oh, he's always so busy. When he's in the AW zone, he's in the AW zone, and he's all in for that. But then he has to switch that off the next day because he's going doing Fulham stuff. Mm -hmm. He's going doing Jag stuff or whatever. If at any point the E-Fedder that bought the company wants to become the IRL E-Fedder, yes, of course, there is a risk that has a knock-on effect to AEW. Again, we're dealing completely speculatively, but I would say those are reasonable things to at least debate, converse about, and slightly fret about because there isn't much precedent for promoters, bookers, and creative types being able to juggle those things. And it's interesting as well in terms of what the future holds for Ring of Honor because obviously they've got the Supercard of Honor coming at the beginning of April, I believe, and there was a plan initially with the Sinclair Broadcasting Group to do some TV following that. Do you think they're going to continue doing a Ring of Honor TV show? Let's talk about it becoming AW developmental. What are your thoughts on that? And as, as I mentioned, the risk for Tony Khan and, and the wider AEW picture, I suppose. You can't be brilliant at everything 24-7, no matter how switched on, no matter how intelligent, no matter how motivated, no matter how much luxury you have in terms of wealth to be able to do these things. Um, we've seen it time and time again. Well, lucky that Rampage is one hour I haven't really seen much in the way of the addition of another hour of television really stretching AEW. We are recording this um, on the eve of Revolution, the hype for which has been absolutely incredible. In fact, it was probably better in terms of build than both Full Gear and All Out, which were AEW's two most well-received pay-per-views. Yeah. So I don't think there's any danger at present, in, insofar as AEW goes, of Tony Khan running out of creative juice, which, I hate to say, happens to every single pro wrestling booker. It's a cyclical thing. The addition of a brand new entity, if, in fact, Tony Khan is going to run and book it, does ha hold the potential to completely overwhelm him. Um, I know that QT Marshall formats the shows. If he hasn't started doing this yet, he should absolutely create some kind of booking succession plan. You don't want to consider yourself surplus to requirements. You wouldn't think you were good enough to do the job in the first place if you did, but it's just good business practice. Mm -hmm. And the man's a very good businessman of... He's, constantly focused on the new there's new waves of talent there's waves plural of talent one might argue that he's a little bit too focused on youth and he hasn't presented a lot of the major stars as the absolute be all and end all um if he's so youth oriented and how he develops talent maybe he needs to apply that particularly given this news to booking mm -hmm. like identifying who can book i know qt marshall is considered an astute enough mind to format these shows but can he actually book should he create some kind of internal program in which he teaches people Possibly because there's a reason why they changed the structure back in what, like late 2019 or something like that. Was you yes, telling me? Yes, absolutely. He's got full control of the book, and frankly, he's done an absolutely tremendous job of it. All you need to do is uh, look at the winners of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Award, <laughs> which I'm sure won't be a controversial uh, comment whatsoever. But yes, he, he will need help. Absolutely he needs help. You can't be amazing at everything. You will end up dog tired. Sorry, what was the other component to that question? Yeah, just the, the risk around it all. And, and uh, what happens to Ring of Honor? And what happens to Ring of Honor in terms of TV, I suppose? And, and the, the, the developmental question, the speculation around it, because they... they well, we'll talk more about the roster in a minute, and um, potentially more additions. But like, there is scope for something. I know we've got dark and dark elevation, which are variations of that. But what do you think? I'm not privy. I've not read about what the plans were subsequent to Supercard. But scrap them. Like scrap them. ROH can't continue as is. There's a reason why this news is connected with people um, in such a deep way following last night's dynamite. And it's got nothing. They didn't put it this way. They didn't do a continuation of storylines that were happening in late 2021 before the news hit that they mm. are pretty much not in existence anymore. They're not carrying over anything from 2021. In fact, the first thing that made real explicit mention of on AEW television, as it pertains to Ring of Honor, was literally the very first match. They are cognizant of the fact that there's a, a law. I know we hate that word, but you can apply it <laughs> like in the correct way. There's a mythology, there's a romance um, at this point in nostalgia surrounding Ring of Honor, the early days, the CM Punks, the Daniels, the Danielsons, the Joes, the Briscoes, like a lot of the names that are going into the Hall of Fame. He's framing it as this revolutionary promotion once upon a time, not this cool new thing that I've bought that we can just keep the fun times rolling because there's no fun times. <laughs> this promotion was dead. So I think um, if it does have a future as a brand, and we, we are not even sure of that yet, they can't just continue as is. So if they did have any plans, scrap them, have a full frank conversation about how this all should unfold and yes it should um do it should represent a developmental promotion i'll give hamlet's thoughts on that i think because i'm going to go back to the should it be a brand in itself later on i'm excited about it as a developmental like honestly i, I don't know if it's as simple as 
put in some Ring of Honor flags on those awesome boxing long turn buckle covers over the dark elevation set. I really don't know if it is just as simple as that. <laughs> yes. The fact that you can kind of wave a magic wand and turn a program you don't watch into one that looks like one you might. I don't mean to be cruel to those that are on dark and dark elevation regularly, but we've talked a lot before about what you are informed is essential in AEW and what you are aware is presented as stat padding for the hardcores or if you want to tune in, you know, specifically um, to see a particular match. Um, so Ring of Honor, like immediately, its value, when we talk about the value of the tape library or of the licenses or the branding of all that sort of stuff, that's where that can really come in handy. You know, you can, the fact that you can mention it out of hand, the fact that you can um, tie, finally, and overdue this is as well, tie all in into the history. Because yeah. it's, you know, it, it is the history, it's so vital. Um, the fact that all that exists gives it more than just a f- box fresh developmental feel. It, of course, will have the um, a certain legacy, a certain mythology, as Cedric says. The risk attached to that is that it's got too much of a um, WWE, ECW type quality where that was never anything more than a seashore. That never felt more like a secondary strand of something that was long dead. It's maybe cruel to some Ring of Honor hardcores to c- call Ring of Honor dead because, of course, they were running a supercard of honor. Of course, they said they were going to exist in a different form. Mm-hmm. But the Ring of Honor you knew w- was dead. And I think interest in it across the board was dead. We do this for a living and we try and pack in as much wrestling as we can watch in a week. Ring of Honor was something years ago I selectively decided I couldn't make part of my weekly rotation, not least when the key players were the elite who were spinning off into forming their own organization off the back of how they'd worked in Ring of Honor anyway. So what I might have once needed from Ring of Honor was provided by All Elite Wrestling. And I think that would be too transparent if you try to present it as fair enough for development because you haven't heard of these guys but this is ring of honor as you knew it as you love it and it's back but if you say well ring of honor went away for these reasons if you dare in wrestling to be a little bit more transparent with your audience and say ring of honor went away for these reasons but there are so many wrestlers on this roster that you love that had the privilege of going through a system mm-hmm. and we want to replicate that system for the younger wrestlers today so the aw you see today it's from the Ring of Honor from yesterday. The AEW you're going to see from tomorrow is from the Ring of Honor today. And you present it as if it's some sort of great, glorious wrestling life cycle. WWE never did that with ECW, even though they stole loads of the concepts, loads of the wrestlers, loads of the ideas, loads of the ethos. You know, Paul Heyman was a creative genius for that spell that we always say. And WWE thought, we'll have some of that. Not once in the ECW relaunch did they mention that. It was just like, want a kendo stick match? <laughs> you know, like there is a way to, um, you can celebrate its legacy without sort of completely sacrificing Mm. what the letters mean in your new presentation of it. I I genuinely dread their attempt to present Ring of Honor as an existing version of itself because you look at the most obvious example of it going wrong and that was like Vince McMahon's WCW. Yes, Booker T and Buff Bagwell were on Nitro. They were very authentically WCW, but they weren't enough of a WCW. And I think that's what that Ring of Honor would immediately look like if they even tried it. I'm not necessarily sure that's the case. The reason why ECW became what it did and the invasion became what it became is because Vince McMahon couldn't sanction the idea that anyone was vaguely competitive with him or that anyone else's vision of pro wrestling could like stand toe to toe with his because he hates wrestling. He was a sports entertainment mm-hmm. guy and he had to project his values of sports entertainment onto whichever intellectual property he purchased. If you look at um, AEW, and it's one of those reasons why I think the people who claim to actively hate it on a blanket level are completely operating with an idiotic mindset and complete bad faith. In a way, this is the most Michael Sidgwick thing that's ever been said. It's, it's impossible to hate AEW. <laughs> it's, it literally is impossible to hate AEW. If you look at the... the the span of genres they promoted. The wrestling Luch- buffet, you often both say. Yeah, Lucha Libre, death matches, pure intricate technical wrestling now with Danielson, Punk, Moriarty, Garcia, um, irreverent comedy, like plunder, like FMW-style matches. We were talking about this in the office not the other day. There's not a single genre of professional wrestling, strong style. There's not a single genre. a cage genre. fight. Got a cage fight. Got a cage <laughs> fight. There's not a single genre, like DDT-style yeah. irreverence. There's not a single genre of professional wrestling they have not promoted mm. lovingly and quite authentically, in my opinion. The, we were having this conversation in the office, like, what is something they've literally not done? And the only thing we arrived at genuinely was British rounds. Yes. Commenters let us know, like, we were quite vexed um, with this question. Our friend Anthony Gogo might yet get them there as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he, might, he might campaign for that. Absolutely. And what I'm 
trying to arrive at in my typical long-winded way is that Tony Khan loves all of wrestling and I don't think there's any sort of um, threat whatsoever of ROH if in fact it does get rebooted becoming mm. like a WWE ECW like sideshow maybe in stature but in terms of the action it presents and its identity none whatsoever well, linked to the future of, of Ring of Honor, linked to whether it becomes a t its own TV show, like we say, or a developmental brand for AW or whatever it may be, is the sort of future of the, the roster. I, I often, you know, make a joke in the news about the fact that AW turn around and say, we're not signing anyone else, and then they sign more people, but it's always, in my opinion, and I'm sure you, you two would agree with me, it should be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. You don't just say, right, we're not signing anyone else, because then if... Kazuchika Okada get, becomes free, you, you're going to sign him, obviously, or whoever it may be. Having said that, I know the Ring of Honor roster it, is kind of in a weird position because obviously they were members of the Ring of Honor roster and then they just sort of, some people were, deals were allowed to expire or they were released or whatever. It's all a bit all over the place at the moment. But Ring of Honor, even the latter stages, had so many phenomenally talented people there. What do you think happens today? Do they get like subsumed into... The AEW roster, do you, like you say, do you divvy them up? So you say like, right, well, the younger guys that we want to develop, that we want to, you know, going to use Ring of Honor for your uh, Garcias or whatever it may be, or just the, you know, new new people coming through, we'll put them over here and we'll keep the others on on AEW and maybe change what we present with with Dark Elevation, for example. How, how does that work with the rosters for you? Not to be brutal about it, but you apply the... Because each Ricardo Brock Lesnar principle of thinking, and I think you treat it case by case. Wrestling is well; it's selective in the sense that a promoter could just decide they like somebody and they want them on board. But equally, um, EW has done a reasonable job of presenting wrestling as a meritocracy, far from perfect, but mm -hmm. a reasonable job as far as wrestling goes. And anyone that um, makes themselves worthwhile to whatever version it is, because it's the thing: it's hard to speculate on who will be needed because it's hard yet to see what they're going to be needed for. So if you want. Um, and I'm not advocating this model particularly, but if you wanted an NXT 2.0 model of five or six rotating veteran figures and a host of developmental prospects, then that's going to limit the amount of veteran figures you can bring in. Similarly, if you want something that feels ultra credible from the off, even if you're going to hide a developmental thing in there, um, then you bring in bulk veteran presences with a few young guys that can break out over a period of time. So it all depends on you know what exactly they want out of a Ring of Honor TV show or a Ring of Honor developmental or whatever. But... I do genuinely believe in this case it's cream rises to the top stuff. Um, EW worked with, obviously, Impact when the, you know, the Forbidden Door opened, but um, New Japan Pro Wrestling was obviously tricky because of COVID. Yes. So Impact was there as a way to kind of like pipeline, like create a pipeline of talent between the three promotions, even if it wasn't quite perfect. That was just happening with a Ring of Honor stable on Impact. So already the wrestling world was feeling more open outside of WWE. And you have to assume that, and, and I'm with Sidgwick here, I think most plans will be dropped and will just be rethought now that everything is different. But you have to imagine that the talent that would have broke out from that would have probably been looking for work in Impact long term. So this is a good opportunity. We're doing a Ring of Honor invasion and Impact still exists and still pays wages. So hypothetically, that's our... But all of them probably wouldn't have got deals. Maybe they would have done, but, you know, hypothetically, all of them wouldn't have got deals the best would. And I think you have to take that here. I think over a period of six to eight months, you use a bit of time and you use a bit of due diligence, I suppose. And I don't know. I don't want to be cruel and say, like, you know, don't hire this person, don't hire this person. I think that's unfair because everybody can offer a different mm. value. And I think it's so it's sort of it's unfair to name names, you know, name the boy. You've got to get this one. You've got to get this one because it depends what they're for. But treat it like you would any wrestling signing that becomes available, look at the talent, look at them realistically and what you need them for. If they're good, bring them in. I go back and forth and say AW all the time, but only because of, like, if a wrestler I like isn't getting focused. Mm. It's not the fault. We use Cesaro because the most current example, right? It's not Cesaro's fault if Serena Deeb isn't getting enough TV time, just for example, as was the case when, let's say, a Tony Nese was coming in. That's not on the talent, that's on the bookers to figure that out. If Ring of Honor is presenting more television time or more developmental time, Theoretically, that creates space for other people. So bring them in. In terms of the existing um, ROH roster and the sort of projected NXT uh, ROH roster, I kind of don't know. If I'm Tony Khan, I'm thinking that ROH, with its existing brand value, the nostalgia, the romance, everything else, could exist as a developmental promotion and something in its own right. The idea of dark and dark elevation, while noble, they've kind of failed. There are still too many AEW wrestlers who didn't get the reps on an independent circuit that kind of just 
vanished like mid COVID pandemic. Yeah. Um, so dark and de- dark elevation. I'm like StatPad records. They are shows on which a wrestler can go or a tag team or whatever can go on a spree of wins that kind of don't really mean anything, but they're, they've counted. They're on a match graphic, and that's how you arrive at Gun Club versus Jurassic Express on Rampage. Mm-hmm. Brandy Rhodes had like an undertaker streak before she left AEW. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so the television audience is kind of on the wise there, but, you know, they are going to the effort of making it somewhat viable that they are contenders, and the idea is along the way, they get just enough experience under the bright lights to get better. I would say that that has almost failed. Mm. There's no one who's came of age on dark and dark elevation and they can say, oh, I was in OVW in 2002 effectively when I did dark and dark elevation. ROH could be much like that. If they reboot it under the original vision of long matches, and if you do that, you don't detract from AEW Dynamite's appeal as a promo company, in-ring as well, but angles, promos, like the smorgasbord of what makes great episodic TV. If you reboot ROH as developmental and you make it less glamorous and TV glitzy by design and you emphasize longer matches, there'll always be an audience for really great wrestling, even if it's quite small. And you can get the gun club work in 20 minutes. And even if it's not great, there'll still be an audience Hmm. and they'll learn a lot more than they have been doing. Yeah, I think Andy alluded to it on the news this morning, talking about it potentially being sort of 20... 15, 2016 NXT of like a mixture of world-class matches and then, like you say, just matches to give people reps in the ring. The alternative, of course, if you don't do anything with revamping Ring of Honor, is you have this incredible tape library regardless. You mentioned they got all in now, of course. That was complicated workings of all that. Um, and a sort of subsequent to this news, Siege, we've been talking about the fact that we could still be getting a, another huge announcement by uh, Tony Khan, and that being a, a sort of streaming service uh, partnering AEW with, with HBO Max, which it just seems the next logical step. Yes, absolutely. As soon as that Peacock deal was struck, because you'll never see a WWE network again, I don't think, because it failed. Ultimately, it failed. Like a wrestling-specific streaming service just wasn't enough. You have to sort of absorb it into something mm-hmm. else because every other streaming service... It's got, it's not just a sitcom streaming service and sitcoms are more popular than wrestling. So in the end, it just wasn't going to work. They are looking at that Peacock money. I always thought, these, dark, these episodes of Dark are really long. Why is this episode of Dark longer than Dynamite? <laughs> what is going on? And then you realize, ah, so it's like, I do think that Tony Khan really loves wrestling. And as far as billionaires go, Amphlet <laughs> is nicer than some of them. Yeah. So I do think that he did want to give talent work and all the rest of it, but he, he was having his cake and eating it too with the idea of if I pump out hours and hours and hours of content that barely feeds into my television product, but I can say I have this amount of minutes to a prospective buyer from a streaming service. That's always factored into it. The addition of the ROH tape library just sells his pitch yeah. all the more. It's a is a lifestyle company to an extent, AEW. But also, to exist, it kind of has to make a lot of money, and getting Peacock money is uh, a means of doing that. Precedent setting as well. So like I say, it's a precedence here. So Ring of Honor, un- like underneath AEW, is nothing more than a tape library, creates the possibility of an impact following suit or a PWG following suit or anything like that. Again, companies that figure quite heavily in in their own and different that, ways. And that gets a little bit bad for me, but continue. Well, obviously, that you know, there are kind of, you, you do, what you then have is f- almost following a WWE model and you, like, run, start running out of places to work and maybe talent can't develop off on their own thing. And, uh, you know, there is pros and cons mm. to that. But I do think there was a, you know, like, Impact is probably a good example for this. There are lots of hardcore, dying the wall Impact fans that will stick with Impact regardless. Um but they don't do massive shows and not too many impact events in a year. Some do, and I think that's great, but not all of them penetrate that, um, re- even that wrestling bubble conversation, let alone any mainstream whatsoever. And there comes a point where, like, it's just obviously it's a funded thing and it's just, is it just a ghost at this point in wrestling? Whereas if you take it in and you glorify it in the form of a streaming service, then suddenly that footage matters more yeah. and those people's careers matter a little bit more and maybe people get jobs because there's an mythology with Wrestler X that's now working in AEW, which has underneath it TNA and an old TNA wrestler wants to come in and thinks, I want to be a part of that. And, you know, it's just, I think it's the very, very old territory stuff that might still be remaining out there. Jerry Lawler's or Memphis or whatever still sticks. That didn't particularly draw eyes on the WWE network, but 
this is an entire generation of fans worth of archive footage that is pretty much out there for the taking should this be an AEW business plan going forward. AEW, look, it's a really wonderful wrestling show. It's really great. And it's been like the cure to the common cold in terms of WWE. But if they just wanted wrestling for the beauty of wrestling, we'd have just had all in every year. Indies would have been Indies. You'd have just had not. They formed a company. The company is there to get bigger, is there to grow. It's there to, like, it's there to become another WWE or a different WWE or, or you know, replace WWE, all that sort of thing. You'd, you don't form a company unless you want that company to thrive and grow and all mm. that. So the reality might not be to everybody's taste, but you couldn't really... You couldn't be too, too surprised if that was the model they chose. I'll say this. As when I was a casual fan, before I did this as a job, and, and, and I was made aware growing up, you know, I, I was initially just obviously just watched WWF, WWE, uh, and then was made aware of all these sensational matches that people you need to go and watch with, with Danielson, Punk, and Joe, and everyone else in Ring of Honor. I think if that was me now, and someone said, by the way, if you just pay, I don't know, Nine ninety nine a month or whatever you can get, and you get uh, dynamite and and the pay per views and what have you, uh, and you get to watch all this stuff. I would have leapt at that chance, uh, even even despite the fact it's probably a lot easier now to access it than it was for me back then. Uh, before we wrap this up, Sige, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on a well. There was a theory, and then sort of a cons- not a conspiracy theory, but a, a development on top of that that I saw doing the rounds. A shower thought. <laughs> yes, so there was speculation about a, a Ring of Honor invasion storyline coming to AEW because of the connection of the two companies now, along with potentially Cody Rhodes leading this invasion. Um, have at it. It would be a very 2022 development if this was happening. It's just, it's too 2022 to be happening. But there has been a lot of questions and discourse, um, queries surrounding whether ROH as an entity could invade AEW mm. and you get a nice interpromotional storyline. Mm. I think that is a bad idea for several reasons, <laughs> and I'm going to outline them very quickly because we are short of time. One, the idea of running an invasion storyline optics-wise, given world events, yes. is horrendous, and it's going to be horrendous for quite some time. Number two, the ROH roster, or what was left of it in terms of star power, is nowhere near It just doesn't rival AEW's whatsoever. So even if you could go this route, and you can't, which I'll explain later, it would be a mismatch that would require Herculean booking to make convincing and get over. Angle and Austin threw Buff Bagwell out of the building, as they should have done. Yeah, Yeah, like (laughs) Absolutely. The third thing is that whenever a company, it was the same with AEW and Impact, when they entered a working relationship, the temptation is do an invasion, do an interpromotional rivalry. It doesn't really work like that if you think of the respective um, makeup of each company. These things have only kind of made sense, I would say, twice. Or like maybe three times. One, UWFI and New Japan. The idea is the UWFI is the real shoot league, work shoot, whereas New Japan Pro Wrestling is, we treat res- wrestling very seriously, but still sort of pro wrestling. The UWFI invaded with the idea of being, well, we're the real wrestling guys in the New Japan um, side sort of rallied together as if to say, no, no, we are. There was an ethos on Hmm. each side. Similarly, Combat Zone Wrestling and Ring of Honor. Obviously, the Ring of Honor um, roster didn't get on because they have to have conflicts within itself to make matches and cards. But they all banded together because, like, we hate these hardcore guys and we stand for something else. We have the Code of Honor. So you have two promotions with completely different stylistic outlooks. It makes sense. The New World Order, a riff on the UWFI New Japan, kind of worked because you had some people representing the WWF as it was originally envisioned. Envisioned That kind of works. AEW versus ROH just doesn't work at all in terms of an interpromotional rivalry. AEW is itself stable-based, and all those stables feud with each other. Why are they going to band together because ROH are coming to attack them. It just makes no sense at all. And to win a squash. To band together to win a, what would be a squash anyway, realistically. Yeah. Like you couldn't you couldn't damage the perceptions of your top talent at this point, at least. Well, if Cody Rhodes is involved in Ring of Honor, <laughs> which is not going to happen, is it? It's just a bullet point. Yeah, something to say at the end of the podcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, bullet I, points for life. Rarely, rarely will you hear this. Like, when it comes to Cody Rhodes, it is at this point... Far more fascinating for me to see what he might do on a Monday Night Raw versus a Dynamite on a Wednesday. There's not many talents that occupy that space, but Cody Rhodes genuinely is one of them, I think. Thoughts on an invasion? Don't want it. Same. Don't know if it's just a case of having fingers burned or the reality of the political machinations. Like, like I know there there are certain buy rates that bear out that, like, the AW impact relationship of 2021, like, was far from a disaster, but... Like, did it steer loads of people long-term to watch an impact? 
there are a bunch of Impact fans that maybe already watched AEW or weren't that taken with what they saw to like boost those numbers exponentially. Did, what I'm saying is, did much change and were there all these euphoric highs mm. of even a little version of it that makes it all feel worth the potential hassle or the struggle or the political issues that come with it? I'm, I'm just not fussed. There are a lot of enjoyable things to get from this Ring of Honor relationship in the first five years before you even think about an invasion. Even yep. if the storyline made sense, I'm still not into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, nevertheless, it's going to be a very exciting time uh, to see what the future holds for Ring of Honor, Tony Khan, AEW. Let us know your thoughts on everything we've discussed in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, and subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts. You can also let us know your thoughts on Twitter at What Culture WWE. Watch there, follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflit at Michael Hamflit. You can follow Michael Sidgwick at M Sidgwick. You can follow me at Adam Wilborn. Follow us all at What Culture WWE, as I said. But for now, my thanks to the Dadley Boys. This has been Get the Table. Thank you for watching, and we will see you soon.